sometimes I'll, I'll do uh, in Bahasa as well so that uh, because we do have um, um, international um, participants as, as well for this um, webinar but um, majority of the um, participants are also uh, from the public and also we also encourage the public from uh, like uh, many backgrounds to join us um, so that's why um, uh, I'm going to do uh, both languages as well um, so um, today, um, our title for the webinar is um, The Birds of the East Coast, which is in Bahasa, it's going to be Burung dari Pantai Timur. So today we're going to talk all about birds. So it's going to be for the seabirds, it's going to be the forest birds, and then um, that's why um, we have two, uh, invited two panels today, um, which is, um, uh, have uh, experts on uh, both uh, type of birds, which is uh, forest birds and marine birds. Okay, so let me allow me to introduce you about the background of the program. Um, so this webinar, uh, Ocean Hope webinar uh, 2020, is um, a program organized by Marina Club, which is the academic club of uh, students from the Bachelor of Science Marine Biology and the Faculty of Science and Marine Environment, University of Malaysia, Tonggano. Okay, so in an objective to enhance ocean and environmental literacy among the public through partnership with many NGOs from local and international. So to be able to do this, um, we don't work alone, guys. So we do have um, our co-organizer, which is our main co-organizer today. We have um, uh, Sustainable Ocean Alliance uh, Malaysia chapter. So SOA uh, uh, is a nonprofit organization based in San Francisco, California, that develop leaders, cultivate ideas, and accelerate solutions in the field of ocean health and sustainability. So I'll be uh, sharing some slides, a very simple slides to um, introduce you in detail what is SOA is about. So um, here. So we are so lucky um, as we, um, as a, um, SOA um, agree, uh, they are uh, happy to help us to co-join or co-host uh, this uh, webinar. So with a mission um, to advance the impact of startup, social entrepreneur, and young leaders um, that are developing solutions to the greatest threats facing our ocean. Uh, from, uh, you, uh, they achieve this mission through these uh, two flagship programs, which is uh, Ocean Leadership Program and also Ocean Solutions Accelerator. And guys, if you are going to their website right now, I can see that this Ocean Solution Accelerator program is right now is uh, open. So probably for those who are interested to join them and also join this program, you should check this out. Okay, so they have um, uh, a huge global network um, focusing uh, for the youngsters at the age from 18 to 35 uh, from more than 80 countries. Okay, uh, their focus area uh, are uh, aligned with the UN uh, SDG 14 uh, and then they emphasize on the issues of marine pollution, ocean acidification, and sustainable fishing and also habitat destruction. Okay guys, so um, let's not um, waste any more time. Um, I think uh, our panel is ready today. Um, uh, I'll start with the first panel which is Dr. Hamza. Do you want to say hi to the audience, uh, Dr. Hamza? Okay, good morning, everybody. Now you should hear me. Yes, now we can hear you well. How uh, about our, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hamza, for today. Um, uh, you look um, relaxed and uh, uh, the breeze um, look so good <laughs> uh, at your background. And so, yeah, we have our second panel for today, which is uh, Mr. Anwar. Um, Mr. Anwar, can you, yeah, good, do you want to? Good morning, yeah, good morning or I have to say maybe good afternoon to people that are not in our time zone. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you can do you can do both. Kita boleh um, cakap kedua-duanya. I think uh, Mr. Anwar can speak a little bit bahasa, right? Boleh cakap boleh. bahasa. Juga. Boleh, boleh. Okay, so um, uh, all right. Um, so we are also um, uh, happy to say that um, so far we have received more than 170 uh, registration, which is uh, the participants in the Zoom um, uh, webinar today. And then um, more than 100 um, 
seven uh, more than 130 uh, participants are from local which is from Malaysia and then we have more than 40 uh, participants uh, from the international and uh, majority of them are from Indonesia but we do have from the Libya, Morocco, New Zealand, Singapore, India, Sri Lanka and Myanmar uh, part of the uh, United States yeah so um, let's get started um, okay so um, I'll be explaining uh, how we're going to run this uh, webinar today. Um, we have two slots basically. First, we begin the webinar with the presentation, with the slides, PowerPoint presentation uh, uh, from the panel. So we start with the panel one first and then uh, panel two, we're going to share uh, his <coughs> slide uh, and, and, and then do the presentation. And then we go, we move to the slot number two, which is I'll be starting uh, asking them the questions and also will be um, uh, interact uh, thing with the audience. Um, so, so guys, if you have uh, questions regarding their presentations or you have uh, anything to ask or comments, you can do that uh, on our Facebook uh, account, Diary Campus, uh, which has been shared with many um, uh, Facebook uh, accounts as well. Uh, and also, you, you can also comment on the uh, Zoom uh, or do it on the chat button. Okay, so I'll be reading uh, the question from there. Okay, so um, that's it. I think um, we are all ready. Hamza, are you ready for your first uh, presentation? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the floor is yours right now. You, you may okay. start. Okay, let me share my screen first. So I think you can see my presentation. All right. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar. And I'm very happy to see um, a lot of people around here from, from Malaysia, from around the world, uh, joining us. Okay, you should see the full screen now. Okay, and uh, uh, special welcome please to also to all um, those who signed up from international. Um, I really appreciate it uh, because of the time differences. Some of people, for example, my family in Libya is uh, following and it's 4 a.m. in Tripoli right now. And also, I'd like to uh, thank the attendance of some um, uh, special uh, guests from Malaysia, uh, Mr. Henrico and Mr. Suiko, uh, Sui Suiko uh, and others, uh, Mr. Hashimi from Trigano uh, MNS. Uh, thank you very much for turning up to this uh, talk. We are going to talk very briefly about some species of seabirds in uh, the East Coast. My name is Dr. Hamza. I am a faculty member of uh, uh, marine, and marine Science and Environment uh, faculty in the University of Malaysia Tringano. I've been uh, studying seabirds since 2015, so almost five years now in this uh, area of uh, Malaysia. So first of all, let me try to um, identify what is a seabird in general, because uh, a lot of people confusing between seabirds and waterbirds and shorebirds and others. So seabirds are uh, mainly adapted to live in the marine environment. They have special adaptations to live in that environment. So most of them have a webbed feet. If you have seen ever a duck, so that those uh, webbed feet of the duck have the same example in most of the seabirds. Most importantly, they have a salt gland because when you are feeding on fish, some of the um, water will come with that food and you have to get a mechanism to get rid of the excess uh, salt because salt can, can kill uh, uh, an animal. So there is a special mechanism called the salt gland that extracts the salt from the blood of the seabird and get it out through the uh, nostrils here near the, the, the beaks uh, as a, a concentrated salt. Also, uh, seabirds have a waterproof uh, feathers, so they cannot uh, get wet when they uh, uh, get in touch with the marine waters or sea waters. Usually they live longer than other birds and they um, breed uh, in older age, so they don't breed the uh, next year, so usually a few years before the, the bird can get to the adulthood. And they, they raise a few uh, chicks compared to other birds. So uh, it's, a, it's something uh, special to, to see birds. Most of them are colonizing, um, using colonies to, uh, to uh, reproduction, and also uh, the size can vary from uh, a small, um, patch of birds to millions of birds, depends on the size, depends on the species. So in, in the world, there are 360 species of seabirds out of 9,000 species of birds. So today I'm going to talk about 4% only, and I will leave the rest 96% uh, to my friend Anwar in the second um, uh, talk. 
Seabirds also have a long annual, uh, annual migrations. Most of them are migratory. Some of them are resident, but those who are migratory, they can uh, uh, fly for long, long distances between continents. And some birds can fly from the North Pole to the South Pole, like the Arctic Tern, which is the longest uh, migratory bird. Uh, they can be pelagic. That means in the, in, the, in the deep sea area or can be coastal near the, the, the beach. And they are, they've been used for uh, a lot of times uh, by fishermen to uh, guide them to fishing spots. So seabirds are very good indicators of uh, fish aggregation because uh, seabirds are feeding on fish and also fishermen are looking for that fish. So that we have a mutual benefit here when, when it comes to finding fish. And also it, it is a good indicator to um, uh, uh, guide some sailors or, or boatmen to the land because usually they, they hit to land as well. Seabirds are threatened by uh, many factors, including uh, introduced uh, predators like cats, like mice, like uh, rats and others. Also by, because of uh, uh, bycatch in fishing gear, food depletion, pollution, egg harvesting, and hunting in some areas. So these are the major uh, things that characterize a seabird. In Malaysia, we have about uh, 32 species of uh, seabirds. These photos are from uh, Wikipedia, just to acknowledge. And these are the total hasil, or the total uh, of our seabird wealth in the country. It is not um, uh, very high diverse compared to other uh, regions, but still we have a very unique examples of, uh, of some seabirds that, uh, uh, that uh, form a very characteristic seabird to the tropical waters of Malaysia. So out of the um, uh, 718 or 720 species of birds in Malaysia, seabirds are only 32, representing 4.4% of the birds of the country. So why I'm interested in seabirds in the East Coast? Simply because the East Coast is one of the least known areas for bird diversity in Malaysia, compared to the West Coast. And this is mainly related to the um, uh, to the um, colonial time where uh, the West Coast was heavily um, managed by the colonists, by uh, the British, I mean, and then the, the East Coast had less impact from the British. And with the British came a lot of studies uh, for, for wildlife and nature as well. So uh, if, you, if you look in the um, literature, you find very uh, small number of uh, references uh, telling you something about seabirds in the east coast of Malaysia. One of the major works that encapsulated all of this work is a very long paper, about 26 pages, by Gibson Hill, who, who used it to be the manager of Slango Natur Natural History Museum in the 30s and 40s. The other thing is uh, the east coast is very famous for egg harvesting. So a lot of locals in the east coast area from all the way from uh, Kelantan to Johor, are very famous in the history to, to raid uh, seabird colonies and uh, harvest or to, to take eggs for food. This, is, uh, this can be um, understandable during the, uh, uh, the old times because of people are looking for a protein source, but uh, unfortunately it is still happening in some areas in the East Coast as well. Um, the East Coast is also a migratory route. It's not a major migratory route, but for some species like the Aleutian terns, that comes all the way from Alaska to Indonesia, it has to pass the East Coast. So that's why <clears throat> this, this area is very important for some uh, species. Also seabirds can be a model for um, food web studies and marine pollution and ecology and parasitology, because simply there are very little studies on seabirds in the country of Malaysia. And um, because of uh, seabirds are not part of the curriculum of universities, unfortunately, so we have less interest in seabird research on the national level. And I hope uh, in future this situation will change because we have a lot of potential for uh, uh, presenting uh, knowledge from the tropical area in Malaysia to, to be uh, a leading country in this, uh, in this field compared to the other Southeast Asians. <coughs> I will go through uh, now. Uh, some of I don't, I don't know if you can hear the the, the voice, but uh, 
the audio of the turns. So I keep the, the, uh, some of, some of the uh, turns singing for you. This is a black label turn, or Chama Tingo Hitam, Tingo Hikam, Hitam. And it is a very beautiful bird. This is the first bird I saw in 2015 when I came to Malaysia in Pulau Ritang. So it is the most common bird along the East Coast. It is very, uh, not that common in the West Coast. So it's our specialty in Malaysia. And it, it, it usually nests on bare rocks, small islands. Uh, the breeding time starting now in May and ends in September. And usually the nest is a simple nest on a rock containing one or two and very rarely three eggs. This is one of the um, most endangered species um, uh, because uh, people are collecting their eggs, very easy to collect their eggs. However, this species is very uh, resilient. So that means it can replace sometimes the eggs uh, with uh, another clutch of eggs if these eggs have been collected early in the season. So the next species is bright term, and this is, um, the video you see in the background is actually from Malaysia, and uh, it is somewhere in Pahang waters, between Pahang and Johor waters. And this is one of the major breeding sites for bridal tern, the second species of Chama Patu, uh, bridal tern or crop tern in the Malaysian language. Uh, this is another species of terns, it's more oceanic. You don't see them in the coastal islands, so you need to go further at sea to, to see them. And they are uh, nesting in rocks and crevices. It's not easy to find their nest. That's why they are successful. However, in this island, unfortunately, still um, the, the egg collecting is happening at one of these three islands you see in the uh, video. So the clutch size as well is one egg usually. It's larger than the blue, uh, black navy tern. That's why it's more attractive for collectors to, uh, to uh, to get, and usually the breeding season starts from June to September. The third one is the smallest turn in the world. It's a little turn, and this uh, little turn is um, accidentally seen by my friend Anwar in 2015, I think, uh, around his house in uh, Sprinta here in Tringano. Uh, where is the um, moving bridge now, the, the new bridge of Tringano? So that uh, um, area, when, when it was uh, under construction, these turns um, appear to use it as a breeding ground. So at that time, from 2016 to 2017, we had about 20 um, pairs of these um, species uh, breeding there. We have monitored them. And also, uh, of my students have done some studies on their nest selection and also predators in the area. Unfortunately, the disturbance in that area become very, very high because after the opening of the bridge, uh, so people uh, tending to um, use that area. Uh, before that, motorcycles were, um, youths from Tringano riding motorcycles used to uh, use that area as a training area. So that's why these birds left that area. Um, I hope not forever, but uh, they, they move it to a new site. And in a new site, which is not far from that area in Sprintakir, we have uh, 50 pairs, about 100 uh, uh, individuals of adult terns coming to this, um, to this area. And this become um, a model study for some of my students. So far, about five students have done their graduation projects on, uh, on growth and also on site selection, on breeding success, and also uh, hopefully in future we're going to start uh, embarking the new studies on uh, parasites that uh, attacking uh, these uh, birds, ectoparasites, mainly lice and ticks and mites. Uh, and also we're going to uh, try to do some uh, DNA analysis for this population because I believe this population came all the way from uh, northern Australia where uh, the Southeast Asian, uh, Southeast Asian population is uh, leaving Australia for breeding in Southeast Asia and then return back. So that's why we are putting rings as well. I will talk about rings in, in a bit. This um, bird is very sensitive to disturbance. That's why I don't, um, I don't tend to nominate the area where the birds are um, breeding to avoid uh, public from accessing that area and make disturbance to this, uh, to this uh, colony. 
The other species that is very beautiful tern is a roseate tern. I saw this species uh, several times, one time in Tringano in 2015 and one time in 2017 in Bahang. And this is one of the most rare, um, maybe rarest uh, tern species in, in Malaysia. Uh, we don't know if it's still breeding, but historically it used to breed in Pulau, uh, near Pulau Tingol. There is a, uh, a small area near Pulau Tingol and also in uh, Pulau Yu. This is um, uh, a fifth species or fourth species, I don't remember, uh, of terns, the great crested tern. Uh, this is massively bigger than all the terns that you have seen before. And as you see here, you, you see in the middle here, there is a chick or, or young bird surrounded by adult birds. So this, uh, this uh, footage were taking, uh, taken around uh, Pulau Tuman in Pahang, uh, where I believe the birds are still uh, breeding there. We have a mixed population of these species. Some of them are uh, came, coming to Malaysia as a migratory, uh, some, some others are residents. So we don't know really which one is, of course the residents might be the one that, uh, that breeding in addition to the migratory uh, population. A very charismatic seabird species called the frigate bird or Simbanke chiu. And this is one of the uh, three species of uh, frigate birds in, in Southeast Asia. However, this species is not breeding in Malaysia. It's only wintering here. So they, they came usually and they might stay uh, until uh, the, the summer months uh, or, or uh, June, July. And this footage are taken uh, around the Pulau uh, uh, Tuman again. And uh, it is, it's very uh, special bird because it's also stealing some fish from terns. So usually it's attacking terns. So those terns that you have seen before uh, are catching fish. And this bird is known for what called cleptoparasitism. So this is a parasitic uh, species on others. Also, it, it can fish, but because of its long wings, maybe it, have, it doesn't have the same maneuvering uh, capabilities like like terms. So during during uh, my team studies of undergraduate students in UNT, we have started uh, putting some rings on black naked terns and also on, on bridal terns with the permission from uh, Perhelitan. And uh, this uh, this is not a, a massive ringing scheme. It's a limited ringing scheme. I'm trying. We are trying to to see the uh, recruitment of. Um, chicks to become adults in the next seasons. And this year we are planning to visit uh, Pulau Ridang uh, small islands again to see those uh, chicks that we have put rings in 2015 and 16, how they become adults and how far they are surviving these first few years. Also, we are putting rings on, uh, on uh, uh, little terms. All the rings starting with the letter M followed by three digit numbers. So if you have seen any of these birds, those of you are, uh, who are uh, bird observers, please contact us. Uh, it's a white ring starting with M uh, and three digits. And uh, it's usually one of the legs, usually the left leg, we put the, the, turn, the turn leg, uh, we equip the turn, the turn leg with this uh, ring uh, at the left side. Some of the works have been uh, done by my students uh, during their, uh, their studies. And this is, I'm using this for public awareness when I come to visit schools. So we had a very uh, successful um, uh, few schools we have visited uh, uh, and trying to raise the awareness about the importance, first the importance of seabirds in the marine ecosystem because they are far important, same like sea turtles or same like fish or whales because they are part of this food web. And also we're trying to say no for bird uh, egg consumption because Actually, bird eggs can contain a lot of heavy metals and some, uh, uh, it can cause some problems for people who are consuming them, not, uh, not to uh, exclude some uh, bacterial uh, agents as well. And also, it's very important to stop pollution because a lot of this pollution is picked by seabirds because seabirds seeing plastics as food items, so they are uh, picking uh, those plastics and tar and others, uh, and this is very toxic for, for seabirds. And this is one of the uh, programs that we have done in 2016 in uh, Pulau Ridang uh, Primary School. It's the only uh, primary school there. 
And we had uh, a promise to do a similar program in pull out human as well, because we had um, uh, we have collected uh, very good data from from pull out uh, human uh, smaller islands as well. In the picture here on the left, my uh, colleague uh, Wong Chi Hu, he was with me with, with all of these uh, surveys, and without him, uh, I, he make he make a lot of things easier for me to to communicate with, with locals and to get permissions and so on. So I, I just wanted to thank him very much and I hope that he is one of the audience today. Uh, among the public awareness programs that we are doing as part of MNS, because I'm, a, I'm also an MNS uh, member uh, and member of the uh, uh, Barrel Conservation Council of Malaysia as well. So we are uh, trying to use opportunities like today. Today is the World Migratory Bird Day, 9th of May. So this is where um, all the nations in the world agreed about this, uh, uh, this day. And it is coordinated mainly by CMS, which is a Con Convention on Migratory Species. And that's where most of the migrants arrive to the breeding uh, areas again. So most of the migrants we have here in Malaysia already left to the north or sometimes to the south for their breeding grounds. So we have done few uh, uh, since 2015, we started to, this, to do this annually. Unfortunately, today, this is our celebration with the Bird Migratory Bird Day because of this uh, movement control um, orders. Uh, so that's why we cannot get to the field. I hope that we can get to the field very soon. Thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. I would like to thank UMT, my host university, Malaysia Nature Society, Perhelitan, Tamil Laut Malaysia, Pacific Seabird Group and the EFPP, which is the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership. Both of these last two organizations, international organizations, have helped us financially to do some of these um, uh, surveys. And we are hoping to do other, other surveys in other areas like Pulau um, uh, Layang Layan and also uh, Pulau Pira in the West Coast. Also, I'd like to thank again my colleague uh, Wang Chihu. He is also the president of MNS in Tringano, and uh, the next speaker, Mr. Anwar McAfee, for their uh, uh, continuous help and uh, guidance. And uh, I, I will um, receive any questions uh, on today, or you can send it to email or Twitter. This is my Google Scholar uh, page where you can see full papers of these surveys since 2015 up to date. Thank you very Thank you. much. I give, I give the floor to the host. Yeah, thank you so much, Hamza. Uh, that was very uh, interesting. And then um, I'll do, before I pass the session to Mr. Anwar, I would like to uh, welcome um, Mr. Henry Go, the former president of MNS, and also Sui Ku Wan, the best uh, the, uh, water bird observers in Malaysia. They're joining us uh, in the Zoom. Uh, and also, please welcome Ms. Tanya, uh, which is uh, executive, uh, uh, Dr. Tanya, which is the founder and the, the executive director of Diverse Clean Action from Indonesia. So welcome, um, Selamat Pagi from, uh, to, uh, to the all Indonesia um, audience as well. Selamat Pagi. Okay, so um, we pass um, uh, with the presentation from uh, Dr. Hamza. Uh, I, I know we, we do have a lot of questions to ask about uh, um, uh, seabed, but just keep it um, uh, for the moment. We'll continue with uh, Mr. Anwar, who's going to talk about the forest bed. So, Mr. Anwar, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Dr. Hamza, for your, your presentation this morning. I just have a few slides to share with you, and my perspective is uh, maybe a bit, a bit broader because I'm not a researcher uh, per se at a university in birds. I'm not an ornithologist. I'm just a, a, someone who likes spending time outdoors and bird watching. And I've been in Tringanu now for 30 years. And as Hamza mentioned, even back during colonial times in Malaysia, there was very little activity, research, study of the birds on the East Coast. Much of it was concentrated on the West Coast. So there is a, a real lack of information on seabirds and also uh, the birds that are found in the forest. Um, so I will, I will, let's see. Okay, I'm just gonna talk about um, uh, why I think uh, people should be interested in birds because uh, many of us that joined uh, the forum today uh, we already have an interest in birds. We already have some knowledge and some experience. But 
Um, I think Dr. Hamza alluded to it, the fact that in the school curriculum, there is not a lot of um, uh, introduction to wildlife and birds. And uh, I feel, and I think this is the case in much of the world, the Western world anyways, that many uh, scientists, if you ask them, uh, they, got, they got an interest in science or an interest in the environment through birds, through uh, studying birds at a very simple way at a young age. And so I always uh, try uh, and share with people what, what is so interesting about it, because uh, the general public thinks bird watchers are crazy people. They don't really understand why they go out with binoculars uh, early in the morning, what is so great about it. So um, there are actually many reasons, and I'll just go through a few uh, today, but there are others. One, first and foremost, of course, is, is the beauty of birds. Birds are, are beautiful. Um, they are very colorful. If you look at them carefully, uh, you'll be amazed. Like this is a pigeon and most people when they think of pigeons, they think of rock pigeons, rock doves, which are all gray and mottled and not very attractive. But there are many species of pigeons that are very colorful when you can look at them up, up close. So beauty is one. Um, also, not just in the appearance, but in the songs that they have. Each species of birds has different songs, different calls. You can identify them uh, that way. And so that's a very interesting facet. We hear bird sounds around us all the time, and we're not aware of it. But if you stop and you, you listen, there's a lot of wildlife right outside your bedroom window. We're very fortunate to have that. Also, uh, great diversity. Uh, there are approximately 10,000 different species of birds on the planet, and they are found throughout the planet. And uh, that's, that's kind of amazing. So uh, with that in mind, we can say that birds are one of the easiest forms of wildlife to see. And if they're the easiest forms of wildlife to see, then it's a great thing for young people to study or to take an interest in. So the, the beauty of birds, the colors they have, their songs, the diversity, and of course, birds can fly. It's something that has appealed to civilizations throughout history, the challenge of wanting to fly. They have that capacity. So for those reasons, plus others, yeah, birds can be quite interesting. Um, another thing is it's a very easy form of wildlife to see. You can go for a walk in a city park or a garden or out by the forest or in a state park or national park, all of those places have birds to see. And because they're easy to see, it's a great thing to do when you go out for exercise. And it's also a great way to introduce wildlife and the environment to young people because when they pay attention to it, uh, they, will, they will feel a stronger attachment to their environment. So birds are important for that reason as well, getting people to be more aware of their environmental uh, surroundings. And also, birds are challenging to study. You give any new person a field guide to a country and the information is overwhelming and complex and confusing. It, it takes a long, well, it takes me anyways, a long uh, period of time to become comfortable with the species that are around us, to be able to identify them, to know what they sound like, when they're available, when they're not, if they're migrants. So you learn a lot about uh, things as you as you challenge yourself to uh, to study them, and we all like challenges, and so it is a great thing to get young people uh, involved. And uh, uh, besides that, I'll talk for a second about citizen science because uh, this is another way that ordinary people can contribute uh, to knowledge. If we look at the ornithologists. Uh, that are out there studying, they, they, they actually rely on uh, bird watchers or the general public that are out there gathering information and sharing it uh, to get a bigger picture of what's happening. There are very few people studying birds on the East Coast. There's a map here on your screen on the left, which is, this is from My Garden Bird Watch, which has run for 10 years. And if you look at the picture with the students here, this was a few days uh, workshop we did out at Kinyir. And uh, the gentleman with the cap there is uh, Sui Seng, and Sui Seng and Carol are with us here. They're, they're Malaysian Nature Society members, uh, excellent uh, conservationists, excellent bird watchers, and they have helped me a lot here on the East Coast, becoming familiar with 
um, the birds that we see here. So if we look at this map, this is an annual survey done in Malaysia uh, for garden birds. People record what they see and they submit it. But you look at the East Coast where Tringanu is in the peninsula. All the way up and down the East Coast, there are very few people actually uh, contributing uh, information on what is out there. On the West Coast, there's, a, there's an abundance of people, but on the East Coast, there's a real uh, lack. And so we, we hope, we have teachers here in the group today as well. Um, so we hope that we can encourage young people to take an interest and do that through, through bird watching. Um, I'll share just a few pictures here of some of the birds that I like uh, that can be easily found here in Tringanu, where we're, where we're located today. Uh, we have nine different species of hornbills in our forests. And those nine species, not all of them are easy to see, but you can see all of them. I, I feel very strongly that Tringanu, where we are on the East Coast, is probably one of the best places in the world to see hornbills because of its ease of access and that the diversity is there. So on your left, you have the great hornbill, which is Ngang Papan. And uh, the first nest of this hornbill for Malaysia was here in Tringanu. And then the top right, you have the rhinoceros hornbill. Uh, this is uh, strongly associated with Sarawak. Um, and people often think that this bird is not found here in the peninsula, but it's also one of our more common hornbills in the forest. And at the bottom, uh, we have the white crowned hornbill. And the interesting thing about this hornbill is that it has fossil records dating back approximately 45 million years. So this species has been on the planet for a long, long time. And yet all of our hornbills are in the threatened uh, category. I mean, their populations are in decline. Um, and this uh, critically endangered helmeted hornbill has been hunted throughout Southeast Asia. The numbers have dropped rapidly Yet we still have populations in our forests that you can see and hear here in, in Tringanu. These birds require, all these hornbills require vast areas of forest. And if we have good diversity, easy to see uh, uh, individuals, it tells us that the forest is still healthy. The forests can still sustain these animals that require lots of food, lots of space, lots of healthy habitat, and um, uh, old growth trees where they can nest. So by having such diversity in our forests in Tringanu, even though there is not a long history of people studying the birds here, we know the forest is relatively healthy, intact, and uh, we can work with the authorities to make sure that our forests are protected through the study of birds. Um, the last thing I want to show you is not to plug a book or anything, but because we are talking about birds on the East Coast, there is one book on birds of Tringanu, which is um, a large part of the East Coast. And I put up a map because some of the questions we were getting uh, over the past week is where are good locations. So in some published materials like this, you can see that we have set out locations or places that are providing easy access to do a variety of birds. And some of the coastal locations that you can see on here, uh, like Kijal at the very bottom, you can see some seabirds which are nearby on offshore rocks that can be seen from the beach. And also uh, the islands, Pula Prahentian, Pula Redan, Pula Kapas. You can go to these islands and see the seabirds that Dr. Hamza was talking about. So that's my, my, little, my little bit about um, uh, the birds, the birds of the forest, the other types of birds, and maybe we'll have more of a discussion, more information could come out in the latter part. Thank you, Mr. Anwar. Um, yeah, I think um, I can see that um, uh, all the birds are really beautiful. I just, I just wonder, it just came up, um, like if you wanted to see a bird, uh, this question is both, uh, for both of you, um, Mr. Anwar and Hamza, uh, which part is actually for the birds, which body parts of the bird is the most beautiful beautiful part, I mean the most uh, fascinating, fascinating part. Like um, is it the feather or is it the eyes or is it the uh, beak or is it the, you know, the face? Um, so yeah. 
Well, I guess, uh, okay, uh, first, uh, the first would be obviously the feathers because the feathers are what define a bird. No other animal on the planet has feathers except for birds. And uh, the, fur, the, the, the feathers assist with flight, they assist with waterproofing, with insulation, and of course, color. And uh, most people find two things attractive about birds, the color and also the call. Uh, so uh, I would say the most attractive thing for birds is, is the plumage, the coloration of the bird. Eye, not so much, not a lot of variety in the eyes, but the bill is very interesting because different families of birds have completely different shapes of bills. And uh, that tells us something about how they survive in their environment. But for me, it's the feathers. So I think uh, it's, it, that works for seabirds as well, because it's, the morphology is basically quite similar. I mean, there are similar things. It's just that they're differentiated based on their ecology and habitats, right? The seabirds and the forest birds. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, so yeah, I think um, what, what, what I can say, which is one of the most important message um, uh, based on your presentation, both of you, that we can say that birds, uh, uh, birds are actually uh, the group of um, wildlife uh, which can become a good bioindicator for the uh, health of our ocean and forest which is that you don't need to have a very sophisticated method or scientific method uh, to see or you know to um, to quickly check uh, if our forest or if our ocean is healthy just by if you can see if there is a good um, uh, population of birds then you can um, quickly say that oh so far it's, it's been it's been good uh, do you agree with me um, Hamza yes in, in many seabirds actually um, uh, colonies are indicators of a good uh, ecosystem because uh, if there is no enough food for that colony usually birds will desert breeding for that season and in some cases some birds have moved it the whole colony to a new site simply because there are not uh, there there uh, is no enough food for that uh, for that birds to sustain and other um, things are birds are used as bioindicators for uh, many pollution studies starting up from heavy metals to uh, to uh, uh, microplastics nowadays and also to uh, some uh, uh, related what is the the polemics of the uh, polymers that it it's contaminating our, our, our uh, oceans and pick it up by plankton and fish and then by seabirds as a bioaccumulative uh, patterns. So seabirds uh, are used it, either their blood or their uh, feathers are used as a bioindicator. This also applies on terrestrial birds as well. Thank you, Hamza. So, um, Jadi, uh, I'll, tr I'll try to um, make it in uh, bahasa. So, what I was asking, uh, apa yang saya tanya tadi adalah um, sebenarnya burung ini merupakan uh, satu indikator, uh, indikator ataupun satu uh, pengukur tentang uh, bagaimana kita nak tengok uh, lautan kita ataupun hutan-hutan uh, kita tu sihat. I mean, they are in good condition, they are healthy, sihat. That means it's okay. So if you can see, kalau anda semua dapat lihat uh, populasi uh, ataupun uh, populasi burung-burung yang um, baik di kawasan anda, that means uh, sebenarnya itu adalah indikator bahawa kawasan anda uh, di kawasan uh, sekitar kita, uh, lautan dan juga uh, hutan ini adalah um, dalam keadaan yang uh, baik lah. Okay, jadi... Um, Maisa, yeah. I would, I'd like to add to that just um, uh, as bioindicators. Another thing is observing birds over a long period of time, because when we see changes in populations, it means something is changing in the environment, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse. And because we have very few historical records on the East Coast, we can't look back and, and see what populations were like uh, 50, 100 years ago. But you can in many other countries and in other parts of Malaysia. Uh, so it's very important uh, that even uh, individuals are interested in collecting information on birds uh, over a period of time because we can look back at that and it will indicate what's happening to our environment. Yeah, uh, terima kasih uh, Ms. Anwar. Uh, then uh, satu lagi, uh, uh, one more important I think um, uh, element for us to discuss today is um, um, bird watching ataupun study about birds is not um, only uh, about biology. It's not only about ecology of the bird. Bukan hanya sekadar biologi ataupun ecology ataupun scientific 
of the birds. Tetapi, uh, if you, um, um, uh, there's one paper that mention sekiranya um, industri, uh, bird watching ataupun uh, uh, dalam bahasa Melayu apa kita kata, um, aktiviti melihat burung ni um, menjadi satu industri yang dikomersialkan ataupun uh, 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 tourism activity uh, yang dikomersialkan um, seorang pelancong biasa yang datang ke, kalau kita kata Terengganu Biasanya, they, they're willing to spend uh, about 30 ringgit, 30 ringgit atau 20 ke 30 ringgit dia sanggup untuk spend uh, kalau mereka hanyalah sekadar uh, pelancong biasa. Tetapi, jika seorang pelancong itu datang dengan niat untuk melihat burung, uh, just they come for bird watching activity, they have in their pocket uh, the money about 300 ringgit to spend on this activity. Jadi sebenarnya, potensi ekonomi uh, dalam aktiviti um, Bird watching ini sebenarnya sangat besar dan sangat tinggi dan saya rasa pihak kerajaan sepatutnya I mean it's time that they think about this sebab uh, maksudnya uh, aktiviti bird watching ini boleh dijalankan oleh um, uh, orang tempatan tetapi kita perlu memberikan maklumatlah kepada mereka. So Mr Anwar do you want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, bird watching definitely globally is a, a huge economic boost to to countries around the world. Uh, you cited a study in Malaysia. There are very few studies on bird watching in Malaysia and economic benefits. But if we look at the United States, the Fish and Wildlife Department, they gather data on this very detailed data on a regular basis. Their most recent published data on bird watching was that bird watching in 2016 generated or contributed to the economy 76 billion US dollars. That's the American economy. That is uh, buying equipment, buying books, traveling, fuel, food, hotels, paying for the services of nature guides, paying admission fees to state and national parks and recreational areas, all that combined contributed 76 billion US dollars to their economy. Uh, if we just get a small trickle of that, if that can grow here on this side, um, there is economic benefit proven in other countries. And to have this, to have this bird watching, you need to have healthy habitat, protected habitat. You have to have information, books, pamphlets, and you have to have trained guides. Malaysia has the healthy habitat, especially on the East Coast. The forests are still very healthy, but there's very little access for the public to forests. There are, even in our national park, um, the Tringanu side of the national park, there's only one trail that I know of on there. Whereas if you go to Pahang, or you go to Fraser's Hill, or even areas in Selangor, there's a network of trails and a network of trained guides that can take people out. Here on the East Coast, that is all in its infancy, but the potential is there because we have the species, we have the habitat, we're missing a few of the other things. Thank you. So um, uh, we do have, we do receive a lot of questions on the message. So I'll try to um, read um, one by one. Um, I try my best. But uh, before I do, I do that. Um, I'd like to welcome also Prof. Uh, Professor Ahmad Ismail, which is the president uh, of the current president of MNS, uh, which is watching us now on Facebook Live. Uh, so thank you for your support, um, Prof. So I'll be asking. I think the first question. Um, which is um, uh, from Yen Yi Lu, uh, and then you say, Dr. Hamza, uh, in your research team, are there anyone working on the vocalization and communication of seabirds? Because most seabirds are colony nesters, and I wonder if they have individual vocal signatures to identify members of kin. Okay, then another question from Yen is um, uh, this is for both of you. Uh, what is your experience working with local or indigenous people? Thank you. We we'll start with Hamza answering that first. Right. Thank you for the question. I know uh, why uh, he is asking the question because uh, our friend is in in, in uh, a Malaysian in New Zealand. He's studying uh, uh, birds as well there. So I hope that we will meet him when he once he come back to Malaysia to finish his studies. Um, no, unfortunately, we are not studying um, uh, vocalization. However, there is a huge wealth of literature. Uh, about uh, uh, seabird vocalization and other birds uh, as well, where uh, they be able to have different types of vocalizations to recognize each other. So the mother can recognize, because when it comes to colony, it's really a puzzling question, which one is my chick? So you, if, if you 
if you land as a mother uh, loaded with fish to feed uh, your chick, mother bird, I mean, uh, so you need to find which one is your chick to feed uh, because you are not interested as individual uh, fitness to, to feed others as well. So uh, usually the, the chicks uh, uh, vocalize, giving some voice or some calls that can be recognized by their mothers very easily. So that's, that's proven in many uh, seabird species. We are not doing this uh, here, but uh, maybe in future, yes, we can, we can do some uh, studies about this in future. Thank you, Anza. How about uh, Mr. Anwar? Have you, I think, of course, because if you wanted to see a bird, you have, you've got to go to remote areas, like, you know, uh, probably at the back of, uh, you know, a village's house, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, um, so, yeah, how, how, what's your experience on this? Okay, well, so far, I have not engaged closely with the, the uh, Aboriginal communities here in Tringanu with the, the explicit uh, focus of uh, bird watching and birding. But we do have two distinct uh, communities here in Tringanu. One, the Samat Bri, which is located on the uh, east coast of Tasik Kenyir, which is where I usually go to do my bird watching in the forest. And then we have uh, Batik which is just outside the Tringano border in Kualako, the national park in Klantan. But these two groups uh, mix and meet a lot. So the populations, we can say they're familiar with each other and they're familiar with the territory. So uh, what we have planned, the Malaysian Nature Society, working with BirdLife International last year and this year and early next year, we will be continuing with our helmeted hornbill survey in the forests of Tringanu. And uh, the first uh, phase we completed, a uh, rapid assessment uh, for several months last year. And as soon as MCO is finished, as soon as we're allowed to move around again, we will be continuing. It's uh, Hamza, myself, and Chi Ho at the branch. And we will specifically be engaging with the communities, the two communities I'd mentioned, to uh, get their perceptions and gather information from them on uh, how they perceive uh, not just the helmeted hornbill, but hornbills and maybe birds in general, especially around the forts of Tasik Kinyir. So we're moving in that direction. And if the ecotourism industry were to ever uh, really flourish, we have excellent nature guides here in Tringanu, but if it's going to grow and expand and maybe move with a focus on birds, then one great area is to explore working with these communities and who are the individuals in these two communities that are interested in participating in this industry. There's great potential there. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Anwar. So, um, uh, and, and I, I think uh, this is a quite good question. Uh, soalan daripada um, uh, orang tempatan, which is um, Encik Khairul daripada Seberang Pake. Mr. Anwar, if um, you may um, try to speak in Bahasa as well. Uh, can, can birds become invasive species or, you know, it, or, or become not a good thing, at, uh, uh, especially when people use the birds as pet? Because kita tahu, we know, local people, they love birds. But instead of do bird watching without, you know, di, uh, uh, you know <laughs> distracting them, but they, uh, we normally like, they, they, they try to, they love to have birds as pet. So, uh, you want to say something? Okay, I'll, I'll say it in English first and then I'll try and reiterate in Bahasa. I think there's two parts to that question. One is invasive, uh, invasive species. Um, uh, and I thought, well, I thought of two things. One is, yeah, we do have species that come naturally from other areas, or maybe they don't come naturally, but, but their populations take off. And I can think of uh, two. One is the, the um, Javan Mina which has come from our neighbors in the south. And that population, that is a more aggressive mina. And so it is pushing out the local minas because it, it uses the same sort of habitat, the same areas, but it's a more aggressive bird from what I understand. And so it's replacing them. And uh, the work that uh, uh, Sui Seng and Carol with Malaysian Nature Society were doing with the My Garden Bird Watch over the past 10 years shows a trend where local mina species, like the uh, common mina, it has decreased in its people's uh, recording of it. Uh, and the Javan mina has increased and the two have crossed paths uh, over the 10 years. Um, the other example on the West Coast, you have the house crow from Sri Lanka that was brought over. And you can see if you live on the West Coast of the peninsula, you have this uh, 
massive expansion of the population in urban areas so that it becomes a real, a real pest. Um, the other thing we can see here on the East Coast, yeah, there are many people that love birds and they buy uh, foreign birds, uh, small budgies and things, and then invariably they escape from the cages and whatnot. But I don't see those populations as getting a foothold. All the ones that can escape, I don't think they can survive uh, because the area is so foreign for them. And so that has not been a problem. Uh, but uh, what is still a problem here on the East Coast is people that actually, they love birds, they love the beauty, they love the calls. So instead of appreciating them in the wild, they trap them and bring them home and keep them in a cage. Uh, and, and this is actually illegal. There are very few licenses given um, out for uh, trapping of birds. There may be a few from Perhilitan. It may have ended completely, but it's only for a few. And the local people, they still do that. They still trap and keep, keep the birds at home, which is, which is uh, illegal, very un unfair. And uh, the big picture is it's, it's damaging to our ecosystem. Uh, so it's something we want to discourage. Uh, it takes time uh, for people to change their, their, their way of, of doing things. And I think one way is in the schools, if they can get appreciation of nature and wildlife through studying the common birds around them, when they grow older, they'll appreciate the fact that these, these uh, creatures play a role in the environment and uh, <clears throat> they play an economic role perhaps in the future of Malaysia in ecotourism. Yeah. Um, oh, we do have, a, we still have a lot of questions, but I think um, um, just, um, Current with this COVID-19 situation uh, right now, so I, I would like to ask this question from Miss uh, Dian Fitri. I, I believe it's from Indonesia. So based on the, uh, is it is it like um, that for those people, uh, for those uh, uh, human that consume on the birds, you know, wildlife or seabirds. So is there any case of disease or you know related to birds uh, which can be transferred to human? Is it safe to eat, um, you know, most of the wildlife, uh, wild bird, birds? Yeah, uh, Dr. Hamza? Yes, and there are cases, of course, if you remember, before COVID-19, in 2004-2005, we had the avian flu. And many species of birds have been proven to carry the virus of avian flu, mainly ducks and related species, including terns as well. The other thing, so, so birds can also carry uh, some uh, uh, different types of bacteria. Um, Salmonella is a very uh, famous example, which carried with the eggs. And also it can carry cholera, uh, vibri cholera, which is another type of bacteria. So all of these uh, can cause uh, severe diseases uh, or pain to, to those who are consuming uh, uh, birds. Uh, the thing about consuming birds nowadays is ethical more than about food itself, because um, with this modernization of most societies, we have access to different types of meat and we don't need to, to hunt. Of course, there are hunting rights for some local people or regional uh, uh, populations that it's uh, secured by regulations. But for ordinary people who have access to supermarkets and, and to, to, to other types of food, I think it is uh, worth to enjoy wild birds, not to trap them in cage. I don't see the, the benefit of in the tropics to have a cage of birds in your house, because simply if you open your window, you will see a lot of birds singing around without, without uh, uh, you to take care of a caged uh, 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 animal, including the veterinary care and others. So yes, there are some diseases and uh, 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 I can add to that some uh, parasites also can uh, jump from uh, from uh, wild animals or wild birds to to humans, uh, including worms and uh, and other types of uh, of parasites, ectoparasites as well. So I I discourage really um, uh, consuming wild uh, birds or wild uh, wild meat in general, not only birds. Yeah, right. Mr. Anwar, do you want to add on that? Yeah, I'd like to add add to that the fact that we have to realize our population has has grown tremendously over the past two centuries, at least it is shot way up. And we could sustain this population because we have a, a large agricultural industry that provides us with food. And in before that industry existed on a grand scale, yes, people relied on the wildlife that was around them to supplement their, their needs. But today, it's not sustainable whatsoever to have people to say, well, we used to do it like this because the population has grown and it's grown because we have a, 
a large agricultural industry that, that allows our population to grow. And we, we, should, um, we should not accept uh, any wildlife trade now because the population has grown so much that uh, if everyone were to just do a little bit, uh, it would destroy what we have already. Mm. Yes, so that's an important message to the uh, take home message to the audience uh, for today. Um, I think uh, it was to ask this another question. Satu lagi soalan. It's from Susan Hills. Um, she's asking, is there a good online resource of song and calls so we can identify the birds we hear? So that you know, uh, probably Susan is the uh, you know she loves birds. So, uh, so she wanted to see if there are any resources specific to the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia. Is that anyone? Do you have any idea? Yeah, I, I I can't pronounce the website very well, and I'm going to look it up here, and then I'll 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 share it somehow. But uh, there is a website, a global website that uh, people contribute bird calls to, and it's called Zeno Canto. And so you can, you can uh, go there and you can study, study the calls and play them. Uh, I know for some of the species that are endangered, they remove the calls. They don't want to have the calls there because it's a double-edged sword. There are people that want to trap birds and they will uh, use bird calls to attract birds in to trap them. But there are other people that uh, are genuinely interested in in the calls, how they might change the same species, but in different ge geographical regions. You can listen to recordings made in the peninsula and recordings made in uh, Sabah or Sarawak and see if there is a consistent difference uh, to them. Um, so it's a great resource. Also, when you go out birding in the forest, you will see only 10% and you will hear 90%. And so you have to be familiar with the bird calls to be able to identify things. Otherwise, you'll be frustrated. So um, learning bird calls is a very important way of being able to enjoy your time outdoors. It helps tremendously. So the website is Zeno Canto. I'm going to have to look it up on my phone for a second. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Mohamed, yeah. Mohamed Cairo, uh, our nature guide, Extraordinaire has just put a link up in the in the chat. So that website it it is open public can contribute bird calls from around the world and you can download and listen to them. Right. So I'll I'll be asking another question. Even though we have more forty questions coming in, I think we cannot answer them all um, for, in the in this session. Um, we will be will be uh, attending those questions. I think probably later uh, after this uh, webinar finish. So there's uh, one more question from uh, Miss Tanya from Indonesia. So um, so far, how is the status for the impact? of marine birds uh, to the birds in your area like um, uh, I mean uh, the, the status of the impact of marine debris so this is this question is uh, particularly for uh, Hamza and um, how in general you measure it I mean can you see because if we see birds flying we don't know what they carry in their body you know and then um, so uh, is there any other way other than look from the dead bodies of the bird to see the impact of marine debris to the birds plastic pollution, microplastics, and so on, um, uh, such as look at the nest or the environment. Uh, can we say something based on by looking at the nest and environment, Hamza? Yes, the, uh, we don't have um, exact studies right now on uh, debris impact because most of the birds breeding in Malaysia are terns, and uh, most of studies uh, have been done on different species of birds like shearwaters, and other big, bigger birds that are interested in collecting uh, marine debris uh, as a food or as a decoration for the nest. But there are some ways also to overcome this. Uh, each seabird have a, something called a fat gland. It's, a, it's like an oil gland that's oiling the feathers. Uh, uh, usually it's located at the top of the tail, uh, at, the, at the start of the tail. And that gland secreting this fat and a lot of these plastics, uh, when it's digested and circulated with the bloodstream, it can uh, end up in, uh, in this fatty secretion. So by analyzing that fatty secretion of that oil, we can trace uh, elements of, uh, of uh, plastic or polymers that it is originated from uh, um, inhaling or not inhaling, uh, from um, uh, consuming plastic by that bird. We haven't done that yet in Malaysia, but there are a lot of studies I advise if you can go to Marine Ornithology uh, uh, website. It's a, it's a journal specifically for seabirds. There are a lot of studies you can uh, see 
uh, more details about it. Thank you, thank you, uh, Hamza. Uh, another question to uh, Mr. Anwar. We're going to stop at 11.15. So I, I'm going to ask uh, more question to uh, Mr. Anwar. Uh, so it's from Hin Bu Wee. Um, I have seen some hornbills flying around in some suburb areas. So, but can they survive along with our urbanization or, they, or are they just birds which lost their way? So yeah. Mr. Anwar? Yeah, very interesting question. Can we, can we get along as we expand uh, where humans are living and we move into their territories and change the environment? Well, uh, some hornbill species can adapt to humans. The oriental pied hornbill uh, is often found in villages throughout Malaysia, west coast, east coast, in large numbers. Where I'm located on the east coast, Sabrang Takir, uh, very close to Kuala Tringanu, there are groups of 20 or more oriental pied hornbills that move around. And although hornbills nest in tree cavities in the wild, you know, in natural habitat, we are finding these oriental pied hornbills nesting in uh, earthen jars or tampayan in the villages, um, and also in mailboxes in housing estates, uh, because it's like the, uh, a cavity in a tree. And uh, so those hornbills, don't seem to be bothered by people so much. However, other deep forest species like the helmeted hornbill, wrinkled hornbill, uh, they seem to stay in healthy forest only and rarely move out. The great hornbill uh, I have seen here on the East Coast in villages and um, what I would call secondary forest areas or old growth <coughs> orchards where uh, villagers in hilly areas have what looks like a forest, but it's actually 100-year-old uh, uh, durian trees with a mixture of other things. Uh, hornbills can survive in there, but the further you get away from the forest, the less diversity you'll get. So out here in the village, you'll get oriental pied for sure. Occasionally, a great hornbill will wander around. <clears throat> um, uh, so. That's, that's my general answer to that. It would depend on the species that they saw. Most mm -hmm. likely, it was oriental pied hornbills that would be flying around in groups in more populated areas. Yeah, I think uh, that's going to be the, our last question that we can answer uh, on live right now. Even though we have 45 new messages right now coming in uh, for me to ask their questions. Um, but I think uh, there's a, um, I think um, it's time for us to, um, make our conclusion here based on our discussion. I think uh, sebenarnya, uh, what is the most important for the local community adalah, um, we have, the, as, as Mr. Anwar said, we have the uh, diversity. Kita ada uh, kepelbagaian uh, species burung di kawasan kita. And we have the habitat. Kita ada habitat yang baik for them. Uh, it's just that uh, apa yang kurang sekarang ni bagi saya adalah um, pengetahuan um, 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 the, the uh, general knowledge or basic knowledge uh, uh, for the local people. Macam mana sebenarnya, what is the right way of do bird watching? You know, instead of uh, catching them or uh, making them as pet, sebenarnya kita boleh menikmati ataupun uh, keindahan uh, birds, burung-burung uh, ini dengan cara tidak uh, menangkap mereka dan sebagainya. Dan, uh, uh, dan satu lagi uh, elemen yang penting uh, bagi saya adalah untuk uh, kita berfikir adalah bagaimana kita perlu mulakan uh, untuk uh, mengaktifkan industri uh, bird watching sebab ia merupakan salah uh, another um, uh, income you know a way of um, uh, uh, yeah, income for uh, local people untuk mendapatkan uh, sumber uh, sumber ekonomi yang uh, mempunyai potensi yang bagus so um, maybe uh, in half a minute uh, Mr Anwar do you want uh, uh, to say your final say or you know a message to uh, the audience today and the local people and then who are, who, whoever is watching uh, on Facebook live uh, Mr Anwar half a minute <laughs> Okay, half a minute only. All right, thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, all of you, for, for joining us for this discussion today. It was nice to see, to see all of you on my screen. Um, just to add to that, some things that we are still missing here on the East Coast, information and uh, some infrastructure. Not big infrastructure, but a network of trails uh, that need to be out there to give people limited access to the forest environment and our nature guides. As I said before, we have excellent nature guides, but uh, I don't think there's any one nature guide in Tringanu that is specifically trained as a bird watcher like there are on the West Coast. 
Uh, so uh, if we have an increase in uh, guiding potential, a little bit of a trail network in our areas that are protected, and we need to increase our protected areas. And then uh, we, what, what, what I hope for is that there's a spillover effect, that somehow the general public takes an interest in birds as a way to start to learn, to pay attention to their environment. When they pay attention to it, they'll be able to appreciate it and want to protect it in the future. So it's all like a big circle. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Anwar, and thank you again for joining us. Um, um, Hamza, so what do you want to say in half a minute uh, to our audience today? Hamza. Okay. A very big thank you for everybody who attended today. Uh, thank you for um, um, attending our uh, discussion today. I hope that you have benefited. Seabirds are very special to Malaysia. We don't have enough studies on that. We don't have enough uh, protection on that because it's a responsibility uh, by law by, for Perhelitan. And you see how Perhelitan is overburdened by a conservation of other things from, uh, from tigers to uh, sun bears or others. So I wish a Malaysian NGOs working on uh, uh, islands, mainly to protect sea turtles, they can also consider expanding their activities to uh, protect seabirds. We have now the basic uh, knowledge, so we, and we are willing to collaborate with all of them as UNT or as MNS Tringanu. So I hope that um, in future we, have, we can get uh, much better conservation for seabirds and we can see the first seabird protected area or marine park in Malaysia in the near future. All right, um, thank you. I think um, that's going to be um, the, uh, the end of our discussion today. Uh, we would uh, like to say thank you uh, to everyone who's um, watching on us on Facebook Live and also who, uh, uh, for everyone who have registered and joining us uh, on the Zoom account. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's very uh, engaging, um, I think I would say, um, um, discussion and um, um, I think uh, please uh, for the Ocean Hope webinar um, series we're gonna have another three um, uh, series uh, coming up so please watch us and um, uh, stay tuned for the next uh, seminar series uh, on our Facebook uh, page Dari Campus Biomarine and then um, wait for the next update for the next uh, seminar thank you and then uh, thank you everyone and then I'll see you again Ocean should be famous because they have everything and more that all sorts of other celebrities who are famous have. They are powerful, they are beautiful, they're striking, they're unique, and they are majestic. So the oceans should be famous because they've been underrepresented in the past decades and they're in a state now which um, over the past 50 years the pollution and devastation to the oceans, we need to do something about it now. So to make the oceans famous, we'll put it on the radar of everybody, even people who are landlocked, um, to raise awareness of what we can do on a daily basis to help reduce the pollution in the oceans and to protect them. Imagine if you were in a position to order, order a planet somewhere, right? Yeah, like, and you say, uh, okay, I want a planet, it's gonna cost so much money. And, and then you say, but I want a planet that I can actually live on, that it will provide food and provide air. And then the guy at the store says, well, you're gonna have to have an ocean then. Oh, how much is that? How much more is the ocean? Well, that's a lot, because the ocean's everything. <laughs> the ocean is everything when it comes to a planet. So that's why we have to look at the ocean now. There is a lot to do. And uh, you guys, the millennials and Gen Z, and uh, the younger people, We'll have to continue what, uh, what we started. But I really want to urge, in this particularly difficult time, for young people to come forward and take political action. Make your voices heard. My challenge to the millennials is to realize just how powerful you are and to remember the words of Margaret Mead, who said, never uh, lose faith that a small group of committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I would urge all millennials to become social entrepreneurs, 
to combine their business with the social value. Or have the social value first and put a business behind it. It's that combination of getting uh, a solution going with power behind it in a, in a sustainable way. Uh, and you see that starting. Uh, social entrepreneurship is, I think, the center of life for the millennial generation. And empower the crowd, seriously. Experts are great. They know all the ways not to accomplish things, all the problems with doing it. But you give a kid or a car mechanic a couple of tools and an idea, and the world is their oyster. And that future will be a society where the oceans and humanity are integrated probably almost seamlessly. It's going to have to be one big functioning system with us part of it. The, the future of the ocean, I would leave a question mark without a word because that word depends on what you guys push the world to do. The ocean is where I come for refuge. It's a natural, beautiful medicine. We need to make the ocean famous so that future generations can experience what we often take for granted. Hi, my name is Hannah Bloomer and I'm a member of the Sustainable Oceans Alliance. SOA has provided me with unforgettable experiences and invaluable opportunities. Some of the professionals that I grew up idolizing are now my mentors, helping me develop my passion for oceanography. I've engaged in dialogue with heads of state, experts, and advocates at the United Nations and national conferences. It is our generation that together will be the wave of change. Most of humanity knows the ocean's out there but doesn't experience it, doesn't live in it. And so it's being destroyed with nobody watching. And it's time that somebody watch.